Thank you so much for, for attending my Dash session. I'm really excited to be talking to you today about breaking organizational boundaries with observability. My name is Jeff Valio. I am a Vice President of Engineering at Dutchie. Prior to working at Dutchie, I was a VP of Engineering at Grubhub. I held various engineering roles uh, at companies like Apple, Google, and Twitter. Uh, a little bit about Dutchie, because we're not a household name yet. Um, Dutchie provides uh, point-of-sale e-commerce and payment solutions for cannabis dispensaries. Uh, so really, we provide a technology platform for dispensaries to run their business, both online sales as well as in-store. A little bit of information about the company and our scale. So annually, we're processing around $14 billion uh, in sales, so a, a fairly large number on a relatively new industry and relatively kind of nascent market. We're powering uh, 5,000 dispensaries. So we have 5,000 dispensary partners on our platform. Uh, and that's across 40 markets uh, across the US and Canada. So, um, you know, really kind of, you know, large numbers for, for, you know, how long the company has been around uh, and, you know, a lot of room to grow, which is really, really exciting. And, you know, to, to kind of take that rapid growth, if we look at those numbers, you know, year over year, quarter over quarter, week over week, for us and, you know, for a lot of other companies across many other industries, uh, there, there's, you know, that kind of up and to the right uh, growth trajectory, which is really, really exciting. Um, and so there are lots of, you know, uh, uh, pieces that are challenging uh, along with that rapid growth, which, you know, used to be a little bit of the exception, but more and more it's, it's the norm across many, many companies and many, many industries. Um, so, you know, things like doubling the size of a team or doubling the size of engineering is not uncommon. Uh, it used to be kind of the very, very exceptional unicorn of unicorn type cases. And more and more that's happening uh, where, you know, engineering will double year over year. Along with that, the system size and complexity may grow just from normal scaling, right? Like we are doing more business, so the scale of our system has grown, but also feature set and complexity tends to grow along with, with team size, right? So there's that growth of team size as well as complexity. Um, along with that, a lot of industries are experiencing consolidation via mergers and acquisitions. So again, what used to maybe not be as common in technology uh, is happening more and more. And so kind of overnight, you have these instant growth levers, uh, which not only, you know, can add a large amount of engineering talent to an organization, but also increase the complexity of the system and increase the scale of the system, uh, you know, fairly, uh, at a fairly large uh, uh, amount, uh, almost overnight. And you have these kind of, you know, two companies that were uh, totally independent on one day, now are together, one team, uh, essentially overnight. And so you have like, you know, disparate systems, teams, companies, uh, now all tor you know, building towards a common goal. And really like understanding what that goal means uh, is, is really, really important. Just to, to kind of take a little bit of a, a step back, like what are some of the challenges with uh, growing rapidly, right? Th this is not a comprehensive uh, explanation of it, but really, you know, hiring lots of new engineers uh, becomes a challenge in how do you ramp those engineers up, right? So if you're, you know, hiring one or two engineers a month, it's fairly straightforward to really, you know, ramp them up on how the system works, the complexities of the system, um, and really like all the internal kind of processes and procedures. If you're doing, you know, 10, 20 a week, or, or even 10, 20 a month, really getting those engineers ramped up as you know, quickly and as efficiently as an, and as effectively as possible is paramount. And it's not only on, you know, how do we build things, right? How do we build things here at Dutchie? It's how does the system work, right? There's very few, um, you know, large scale systems that are relatively simple at this point, even for a product like ours, which is essentially a commerce product, e-commerce and point of sale, huge amount of complexity, both because of the industry that we operate in, but also because of um, just the large scale feature uh, set that we, we uh, support. Again, like in, in terms of like system complexity, uh, there are not many systems that operate totally in kind of a vacuum at this point. There's a lot of third party integrations, right? There are companies that have solved common problem sets uh, that lots of systems integrate with, right? Everything from 
payments, to fraud, to email, to marketing, to push notifications, to analytics, all of these integration points and handoffs. And those can be with external partners. They could also be with internal systems, right? Other systems, other business units, acquired systems, right? That there are integration points, which new engineers need to learn, understand deeply uh, to be effective. And really it's about like understanding what flows are important for um, for particular systems, right? So if you think about, again, like a commerce product, an e-commerce product, you have that like discovery kind of top of the funnel, um, you know, type flow, right? Which is very important. How does a user come in, uh, discover what they want to, right? What they're shopping for, uh, get to a page about that product, right? Uh, and then go through like a pre-checkout and a post-checkout phase. So there's like understanding those flows. There's also classifying those flows into the critical kind of tier zero flows. Um, you know, things like the checkout, right? Um, you know, landing on a product page, right? Those things are tier zero. There might be things that enrich the product, but if they're not available uh, or not as critical to the business, things like maybe ratings and reviews, which could be like a tier two or a tier three uh, flow for some product. So it's really understanding what those critical flows are. Uh, and for new engineers, like ramping up, it's really like, how can they figure those things out? And it all ties back to like, what's important for the customer? You know, obviously, like, again, in a commerce product, like checkout, super important to a customer, right? Both customers are dispensary customers, right? For, for Dutchy, um, because we're sending them sales, but also the end consumer uh, as they're trying to purchase something. And how do you understand, like, what are the important flows uh, as a new engineer? There are the obvious ones, and there may be the less obvious ones based on on the complexities of the business. And, you know, monitoring can be a really great tool here, um, but only if the monitors are set up in a way that really are focused on um, what is important to customers. And so when we think about a focus uh, on customers from a monitoring perspective, um, we have a few ways to think about monitors, right? A more traditional way to do it is like, we focus on traditional signals, right? And those can be things like errors, Errors could be a good analog to what the customer is experiencing, right? I tried to do an action, I got back an exceptional case, I couldn't proceed with it. They could also be a lot more like nuanced than that. And so does an error actually tie back to a customer experience directly? In a lot of cases, in a lot of systems, a lot of software, like no. And so, you know, errors can be a little bit tricky and they're a giant bucket we're seeing an increase in errors. Like, what does that actually mean for the customer? What does that actually tell us about how this flow operates? Doesn't really tell us very much. Resource utilization tells us even less, right? Servers are using six gigs of RAM instead of four gigs of RAM. Um, what does that mean for the customer? Does it really matter at all? What does it mean in terms of a checkout flow versus a discovery flow versus a post checkout flow? Literally nothing. Um, and so it doesn't really help us uh, understand what the customer impact is or understand what the system is doing. Any non-business specific metric is basically in this bucket, right? Resource utilization, errors, CPU, memory, all of these things don't tie back to customer impact. And so if I'm a new engineer, right, coming into a system and all I'm given is kind of like, here are the monitors that we have set up. I can't tell what the business is actually doing, what's important to the business, what's important to customers. We could be selling rubber washers. We could be training models for self-driving cars or anything in between. Doesn't really tell us very much. This is really where SLOs come in, right? And so there's a lot uh, out there about uh, SLOs or service level objectives. I'm not going to go through like a deep dive of what they are because uh, there's so much out there and people that can explain it much better than me. Really the way that I think about this is it's a monitoring, monitoring strategy for answering the question, what does success look like, right? Success is really driven by what is the customer journey? What is the customer experience? And what does success look like for this feature, for this flow, right? How do we answer that question? And how do we put monitoring around that question, right? And really what we wanna do is we wanna push the customer experience and the business metrics to the forefront um, rather than resource utilization or errors, it's, the success rate, right, of this critical user flow, right, this critical user journey, right? When I hit the checkout button, 0.0001% of the time it fails, right? That is a much, much more clear picture of what is important to the system than error rates are up, right? Just doesn't really tell us very much, doesn't help us learn anything about the system. And it gives us 
an answer to that question, which is what does success look like? So if I'm a new engineer, right, I can look at what SLOs are defined and I can understand this is what success looks like for this product because these are the alerts that they have when we deviate away from success, right? And so just like a really, really like kind of um, powerful paradigm and powerful mechanism for someone coming into an organization, coming into a system and being like, well, what's important? What do I really need to learn about? SLOs tell that, you know, answer that question, right? What does success look like? And it provides an easy shared language, right? Resource utilization can differ between everything from, um, you know, the language that we've chosen, the runtime, the operating system, the hosting provider, all of those things. It makes it very challenging to talk across systems, right? Uh, talk across teams that are implementing things differently. SLOs are a shared language. What does success look like? What's important to our customers? Let's have a discussion around that. Um, when we think about complexity, there's complexity though, not only within my, you know, my kind of sphere, right? If I am working on, let's say, the search engine for an e-commerce platform, right? There is the, what do I own and what's in my domain? But like we talked about earlier, so many things span systems, right? And especially if we look at it through the lens of growth through consolidation, mergers and acquisitions, um, there are going to be multiple systems at a company that are all part of essentially ensuring a customer journey uh, is successful. And so how do those integration points, you know, how do we know what those integration points are doing and how do we know that they're successful? And so it's really easy, right? If, and, and I'll go through some examples in a little bit, but it's really easy for kind of two different systems uh, when they talk to one another, even if they're under the same company umbrella for I am a developer on system A, I call into system B, it's a black box. It is totally uh, uh, opaque. I have no idea what happens over there. I make an HTTP request. I get back a response. Sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's success, sometimes it's failure. No idea what's happening. It's like it's not even the same company, not even the same umbrella. Um, I just hand stuff over the wall. I get back a response. Like I don't really know what's going over there. It's a silo. I don't, again, don't know what's going on over there. And like I have no idea how it works, right? It just totally abstracted away from me. I make a call. I get back something. That's basically it. And there's no way for us to understand between those system boundaries, like what are the common measures of success between them? And so like, why is this even relevant, right? Like folks may be able, like having a tough time contextualizing this in kind of the real world, right? Like you're building a product, you kind of can talk around, you know, one big system, everyone knows how to talk to one another. You bring in another company with another system and you're trying to integrate those things. That doesn't really sound like something that's as common. These are just two headlines I just pulled from, like one is from TechCrunch and one is from a PR, a PR newsletter for my two most recent experience with this, right? So the first one is Dutchie acquires LeafLogic and GreenBits, which are both point of sale companies and closes a $200 million uh, Series C. We closed our Series D today. So that, uh, that's a, another nice uh, headline for us. Um, but yeah, so, so just in the last few months, dealing with two large scale uh, integrations between three complex mature systems. My previous employer, uh, Grubhub acquires payment and loyalty company level up for $390 million. This was just a few years ago um, and very mature, very, very um, well thought out uh, system for loyalty and payments essentially acquired uh, overnight. Uh, now trying to figure out how to integrate those two systems. So like really, really relevant. And like, I'm sure that people can tie back to their own experiences with this. Uh, and if they have an experience already in any rapidly growing industry, uh, this is basically just uh, a matter of time. And so let's kind of go back, take a little bit of a step back into SLOs uh, and then talk a little bit about how this helps with that kind of overnight growth, overnight new systems, two companies now operating as one. We really can think about it as a singular mechanism for understanding health across all the systems, all business units, all of the previous companies that are now under one umbrella. We look at it as like a singular mechanism for how we understand health, um, which is really good because like there is no shared language around health outside of numbers, right? And SLOs are directly tied to numbers and numbers 
they don't lie, right? Numbers are always the truth, right? It's a very easy discussion to say we failed 0.01% um, of our requests, which put us outside of this SLO over this two week period. Here are the reasons why, and here's what we're doing to improve. It gets away from, we saw a lot of errors. There was a big customer impact, right? Like that, there's a lot of nuance in that. And without understanding what the common language is or having a common language really doesn't tell us very much, right? It's a little bit uh, hand wavy, so to speak. We can then have SLOs around the integration points between these systems because in all of my previous experience, it wasn't just, hey, these companies are now one, totally operate independently. It's now let's build an integration between these two systems. Um, and really using SLOs as kind of how we understand the health of those integration points is really, really powerful. And again, it just ties back to, it's a common language framed around customer experience. And now we can have that common language, not only within kind of our previous model of our own system, but now as we expand right through integrations, through mergers and acquisition really gives us that kind of shared uh, and common language. There is still a problem though uh, with this, which is integration points, right? So in the case of Grubhub and Level Up, right, there were integration points for loyalty system, right? Really, really complicated integration. And we could have SLOs around that. But again, it's I failed an SLO on my side. I handed something over to the wall, which failed. And so it you know, made me deviate from my successful uh, metric. Um, but I really don't know what's going on over there, right? And you know, folks who were working on the level up system could say the same thing. And it was just basically a very common uh, you know, pattern that we could fall into, which is, yeah, we understand what success looks like between these two systems, but we really don't know anything past that. Similar to what you know, Dutchie is working on now, it's like, how do we understand cohesively what's happening across these systems? This is really where tracing comes in. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about using tracing as kind of an, a way to kind of expand this shared language and this kind of model a little bit further. And so just like a little bit of a modified definition uh, from Datadog about what distributed tracing is, it's really a method for tracking requests all the way from a front end to a back end to a database across many systems as well, right? So there's a big kind of like, like point in there, which is you can use an identifier across systems to have a consolidated trace. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And that really helps kind of expand what we understand about how the system is operating. It gives us a little bit more of a, like a real time kind of mental model of how the system is operating. If we just look at metrics, we look at errors, we look at SLOs, we don't really understand what services are calling what, what systems are calling what, what integration points there are. Um, where tracing gives us real time, this request was made, here are all of the steps that happened as part of it, and here's how the user got back a successful response. So we get a real time understanding, we can kind of update our mental model of how the system is functioning um, based on what's happening in reality. And really, just like SLOs, it's an observability tool but really it's an educational tool, right? Um, and I think like how, how we think about like the mental model of the system really helps frame that and a little bit more about, uh, about that kind of spanning system boundaries uh, we'll talk about now. So this is just basically what a, uh, a sample trace looks like. This is just like a sample request um, in Dutchy. And so we can kind of see all of the things that happened uh, within this request context. This could be, in one service, this could be across multiple services, multiple systems, all of those types of things. But it gives us a real good idea where we could say this particular request, which I, I blacked out some of the, the parameters here, but this is like a customer arriving for a curbside uh, pickup. And so um, we can say like, well, what happens when a, you know, when a, a dispensary employee says, hey, uh, we're trying to execute this curbside pickup. Um, it tells us exactly what happens, gives us good understanding of how the system is working to service this request, and gives us ideas of are there handoffs between multiple systems, right? And so this is just kind of like a, a visual example a representation of that. Really what we want to use it as though is kind of a consolidated system interface. And so the way that we think about that is basically we can use traces across all of our different systems, right? These integrated systems that we've gotten through mergers and acquisitions, we could use tracing as like the consolidated place for under, us to understand how the entire system is working. So let's, let's, let's like take a step back and kind of use an example. Uh, we'll use like a pretty 
you know, real, like real world example of how this could work within, within our own business, within Dutchie's business. Um, and then kind of like shift it into, well, how can we use tracing uh, to understand this, right? So let's say we set up all the SLOs. We have SLOs around our integration, around what's important to customers. Everything's great. Folks can really learn about like what's important to customers based on that. Um, now I get a page that, you know, we're starting to I get to a point where we might see an SLO failure, right? We're deviating from the norm. I get an alert uh, for my system. Let's say I'm the order processing team, right? So I'm responsible for kind of that post checkout flow, getting that order into the point of sale system. Cool. So I get an SLO failure. Uh, I open up my laptop. I look at my dashboard. I look at, um, you know, some of my key metrics uh, that the alert basically could link into. Um, and I see, you know, high latency uh, and timeouts to calling this point of sale system. Well, this point of sale system is internal, but it's a system boundary, right? It was an acquired company, let's say. So I'm going out and calling into this point of sale system to say, hey, I have a new order for you. And I'm getting back basically some requests are timing out and some are taking a pretty long time. And so I think, well, I have no idea how that point of sale system works. It's a black box. It's another team. I'll just page them. Hey, we're seeing high latency when we're calling you. Good luck. Let me know if you need anything, right? What can happen if we're using tracing? So we had SLOs, but now what happens when we add tracing to the mix is same thing. I get an alert. I see SLO deviating from the norm. I open up my dashboard. I look at the metrics. Yeah, I'm seeing some timeouts going to our internal point of sale system. Um, but now I open up tracing, right? I have a common trace ID across the system. So I can see basically customer request all the way through my system to the handoff to the this internal point of sale system and then everything that happens in there as well right all the inter-service calls that they make database calls cash calls external provider calls all of those things now out from knowing nothing about the system i have an understanding at least from a service level of what they're doing to service that request when i hand it off to them and i can see in that trace let's say that there's latency, right? If I look at the spans, there's a really long one and it's a call to a third party uh, system that we rely on for processing some of these orders. And so I don't know how to fix that, but I can now go to the point of sale team and say, hey, I'm gonna page you. Here, here's some details around you know, why we got paged and why we're involving you. But here's a link to the trace. I believe that it's a, a latency to this external provider. Um, so here are some breadcrumbs to kind of help your troubleshooting. Uh, let me know if I could do anything to help. And then, you know, I, I, I go back on standby. Maybe what that does is it reduces the time to resolution, right? Which is great in a business critical system. That's more than enough. But th there's more to what that actually, that kind of interaction does. And so like what the difference is there. So like maybe it's minor, the time to resolution difference. Maybe it's a minute, two minutes, five minutes. Business critical system, more than enough, right? End of sentence, end of slide. Um, that's that's kind of the perfect uh, ending, like why this is important. But what it really does is it brings those teams closer together. There's an inherent friction by saying, I handed this thing off. I don't know how it works. It is broken. Tell me when it's fixed. Versus, hey, here is exactly what's going on. I did a little bit of digging because I have all of those tools at the fingerprint. I have a super high level understanding of how our systems interact and how your system works based on this trace. And based on this data, this is what I'm seeing. Can you help us, you know, help us resolve it? It really helps break down those silos, break down that black box mentality, break down that mentality of, hey, we don't know how this works. Um, really expanding kind of your own and your team's own mental model of how the system operates. And so really, really kind of powerful paradigm to not only learn how the system works, but really start to bring those organizations close together. And I can tell you in practice, like this is actually what happens, right? You start these integration processes and there's just a little bit of friction between them because it's like, hey, we're doing this complex thing. We don't understand how this works. It's over the wall. It's deal with it. Give us a response back when it works. Starting to use tracing as that kind of common thread between the organization, right? Um, it, it, it just becomes such a, a really, really powerful tool um, to really bring teams closer together. Um, so really just, again, breaking down those silos and really just expanding the overall understanding of the system. And we can push that a little bit further, right? We don't need to just stop at tracing. I think that's a really, really good stopping point and a lot further than I think a lot of teams and companies that are integrating systems get to. But we can send 
not real, right? Canary transactions uh, through the entire system. So we can see with all of the different variations of complex, let's say, transactions flowing through the system and understand when failures could potentially occur. We do that in non-production environments. So we could have this like really great kind of end-to-end -end kind of like real-time testing suite. Um, and we could do it in production to let's say there's a particular type of transaction that's 0.0001% of requests. Um, but it's still really important. And so we don't want to wait for a real one to fail. We want to wait for one of the synthetic ones to fail, essentially, for us to be able to mobilize and, and kind of you know, deal with that uh, with the response. It gives us, though, a singular pane of glass between systems. And so that's like one of the outputs of this, that if we think about it from that perspective is these are two different systems, two different teams, two different technologies, two different patterns, two different languages, different paradigms, every possible thing is different. But when I look at it from the observability lens, it looks like one big system. And the way that I like to think about this is it's like loose, tight coupling. These systems may never be tightly coupled for good reason, right? Failure domains um, is, is kind of the big one. May also facilitate clean architectural patterns, right? Having these things loosely coupled. But that single pane of observability glass through the lens of SLOs and through tracing and potentially through canary transactions, it gives us a single pane of glass so we can reason about it as one large system. And so when you want to zoom out and kind of see how everything is operating, it's not handoff, handoff, handoff. It's this is how everything's happening. And again, those handoff points, they're they should be transparent to customers, right? We really want to answer what does success look like, what's important to our customers. And looking at this as a single pane of glass is a really, really uh, powerful way to do that across like many different systems. So there's a lot more, um, you know, Dutchy is still in its journey of, 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 of kind of getting there, but really we're thinking of these patterns and these paradigms as, as what's going to help us with these integrations. Uh, and really like what's going to be kind of the, the way that we succeed here. So there's a, a, a lot more work to do here, which I think is my uh, perfect selfish segue, which is uh, we are hiring very rapidly. So all of those uh, kind of like unique challenges around scaling teams, scaling systems, rapid growth, like we're in the middle of it. Uh, and so it's a really, really interesting time to join the fastest growing industry in the US and also the company that it's a, that's at the forefront of it. We have a lot of really, really interesting challenges to solve. And so uh, we'd love if folks would come and join us. I really appreciate everyone attending my Dash session today. If you have any questions about any, uh, any of the topics that I talked about, or if you're interested in helping us implement some of those uh, areas or coming to help Dutchie solve some of these interesting problems, feel free to reach out to me. My email is up on the screen. I look forward to hearing all of your questions in the Q&A session.